Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening. You can delete as necessary. Um, today, we are going to continue with uh, this new series on key salvation concepts. Um, <clears throat> the, the last time we were thinking about uh, redemption, how we have been rescued from our slavery to sin and to evil by the blood of Jesus Christ. And today then, we're going to be thinking about another of these shawns, another of these salvation terms. And today's one is not um, really as familiar, I suspect. And it is propitiation. Propitiation. Propitiation is indeed a, a term which has gone something out of fashion. And it is also one that is subject to uh, not a little misunderstanding. So the task today is to try to shed some light on its proper biblical usage. And we're going to, uh, for our reading, we're going to turn to uh, 1 John, the first epistle of John. And we're going to read a few verses there in chapter 4. Uh, reading from verse 7. So John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that phrase there, atoning sacrifice in verse 10, that can be translated as propitiation. Or if you're using, say, the NIV and you consult your uh, footnotes there, it'll say, as the one who would turn aside his wrath, taking away our sins. And if you then flick back in your Bible to Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, if you go to Romans and chapter 3, a very well-known uh, chapter, and just one verse, verse 25. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. And that again can be uh, translated there. A sacrifice of atonement is literally as a propitiation. So what then is propitiation. Well, in harmony with the NIV footnote, J.I. Packer defines propitiation as the turning away of God's wrath. God's wrath, or wrath if you prefer, is God's settled opposition to sin. His determination to punish sin, which is born of his own holiness. Propitiation, then, is the averting of God's wrath by way of an offering. That offering or sacrifice placates God's wrath such that he becomes propitious or favorably disposed towards man. That is, God can act with favor towards sinners without jeopardizing his holiness or justice, because the thing sacrificed has been punished in the sinner's place. Wrath then gives way to blessing. Thus, propitiation is said to be the divine side of the work of Christ upon the cross. It addresses God's righteous anger against sin, satisfying his demand that sin be requited. 
Warren Wearsby sums up propitiation as the satisfaction of God's holiness. And the concept of propitiation is illustrated by what happened in Israel on the annual Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. On this day, Israel's high priest would sacrifice a goat on behalf of the nation's sin. And he would then take the blood of that goat into the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle. And he would sprinkle the blood upon the golden lid of the Ark of the Covenant, a chest containing the Ten Commandments, the law which Israel had again broken over the previous year. The golden lid or atonement cover was known as the mercy seat. And God was said to presence himself above the mercy seat. So God was being propitiated. Indeed, the mercy seat became known as the place of propitiation. And when the high priest emerged from behind the veil and reappeared before the Israelites, the nation knew that God had accepted their sacrifice and they could count on his favor for the incoming year. But let's dig a bit deeper into then the concept of propitiation. And we'll do so with a five-fold analysis. Number one, who is propitiated? Who is propitiated? And the answer to that is easy. It is God. The one who is put out by sin is God. So he is the one who must be placated. Secondly, why? Why the need for propitiation? Well, because sin has offended God. Sin provokes God's wrath. If God is going to uphold the morality of his universe, then sin must be dealt with. A holy and a just God cannot just turn a blind eye to sin, pretending that it doesn't exist or that it doesn't really matter. The moral foundations of this universe would disintegrate if that were the case. Sin, we know, forms a barrier between God and man. And thus, communion with God necessitates that sin be atoned for. So how, or sorry, who and why? Thirdly then, how? How is God propitiated? God is propitiated not through our prayers or you know, incense or rituals or even good deeds, but only through a sacrificial offering. And that offering must entail the shedding of blood. Blood represents life. The shedding of blood, therefore, represents death. So for God's wrath to be satisfied, there must be a bloody sacrifice. That is why on the aforementioned Day of Atonement, the blood of the slain goat had to be sprinkled on and before the mercy seat. Fourthly, the effect of propitiation. The consequence of a propitiatory sacrifice being offered was that God could continue to act with mercy and favor towards sinners. Thus, when the high priest emerged from the inner compartment of the tabernacle, the Day of Atonement actually became a time of rejoicing. For as we noted, the high priest's reappearance signified that God had accepted the sacrifice and the nation could anticipate another year of divine blessing. But another great illustration of this truth comes from one of Jesus' parables. Now, this one made it into Jeff's series of booklets on the parables, so I feel that I am treading on very, very holy ground here. 
And that is the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So if you want to turn to it, it's found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like all other men robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. In stark contrast to the self-righteous Pharisee, the tax collector acknowledged his sinfulness and cast himself upon God's mercy. And you see the phrase that we read there, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That is literally, God be mercy seated to me, a sinner. Or God be propitiated to me, a sinner. And how did God respond? I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the self-righteous Pharisee, went home justified before God. Now, you'll be delighted to know justification is another of our Sean's that we'll be meeting in this series. But in a nutshell, it means to be declared righteous in the sight of God. And that is how God responded. He responded with favor towards the repentant sinner. He responded propitiously. And then fifthly, we're back with another who. Who is the propitiator? Well, that is again easy to answer. The propitiator is none other than Jesus. Hebrews 2 verse 17. For this reason he, that is Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement, and the word is again propitiation, for the sins of the people. And 1 John 2, verse 2, he, that is Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice or propitiation for our sins And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The amazing thing about Jesus is that he is both the one who makes the offering, but he is also actually the thing sacrificed. He functions as high priest. He makes the offering, but It is his own blood that constitutes the offering. Indeed, we might say that Jesus is himself the mercy seat. His body was where propitiation was really accomplished. 1 Peter 2 verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And it was because God's wrath was poured out on Jesus as he hung on the cross that God's righteousness was satisfied. God's wrath that was rightly directed towards us 
for our rebellion was redirected onto his perfect son who bore our guilt for us. And note that whereas a propitiatory sacrifice had to be offered each year, Day of Atonement, under the old economy, Jesus' propitiatory sacrifice need never, contra Roman Catholicism, be repeated. For it is a once and for all sacrifice that has fully and eternally satisfied the justice of God. Hebrews 7 verse 27 he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. In one sense, we today don't need to echo the tax collector's prayer, be mercy seated to me, a sinner, for God has already been rendered propitious towards sinners on account of the great sacrifice of his son. Though, of course, God does insist that we each avail of the value of Christ's death by receiving Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. Moreover, when as believers we slip up and we sin, we know that if we confess our sin, God will forgive us and restore us to communion with himself for Christ's propitiatory sacrifice allows God to do so. As John puts it in 1 John 2 verse 1, if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, earlier I said that propitiation has been a concept much misunderstood. So I want to spend a a bit of time then, our remaining time really, in dealing with um, some of these misconceptions, of which really there are, I suppose, four main ones. First of all, first misconception, God's mood is being manipulated so that he acts favorably towards man. God's mood is being manipulated so that he acts favorably towards man. Propitiation of the gods was a very familiar practice among the heathen nations. The pagan view of their gods and goddesses was that they were unpredictable, whimsical, capricious, even cruel beings who had to be sort of sweet-talked or bribed into acting with benevolence and favor. Thus, for example, the fertility gods had to be propitiated with various offerings or even um, by sexual acts committed in their honor with uh, temple prostitutes. Indeed, in extreme situations, pagans were known to engage even in child sacrifice to placate their gods. And we get an insight into such a mentality in the episode recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 18, that contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. In order to get their gods to consume their sacrifice with fire, the prophets of Baal engage in ritualistic dancing. You'd be glad to know I'm not going to give you an example of that, ritualistic dancing, the reciting of mantras, and even self-mutilation, all to no avail, it should be said. Biblical propitiation is not like that. It is not buying off some sadistic or volatile deity in an attempt to, you know, swing his mood. No, Biblical propitiation is about satisfying God's holy, just, and settled anger against sin. Second misconception. God's hand is being forced, making him act against his will. God's hand is being forced, making him act against his will. 
Some people have the idea that God is basically like an angry despot, whilst Jesus is this sweet, gentle figure who tries to get his father to be lenient, to ease up on his anger. He even offers to die in the sinner's place so that God will sort of relent and and, and give in. But nothing could be further from the truth. Propitiation isn't about making God act contrary to his instinct or better judgment, getting him to do something that he basically doesn't want to do. After all, it was God who took the initiative in sending his son. As our text for today says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. As Philip Riken writes, in the atonement, God propitiates God's own wrath. And with his customary succinctness, John Stott affirms, God does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loved us. I think that is worth repeating. God does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loved us. Misconception three. By propitiation, God's very nature is being changed from a God of wrath into a God of love. God's very nature is being transformed from a God of wrath to a God of love. This is a bit like the argument that the God of the Old Testament is different from that of the New. No longer an angry tyrant, Now this rather warm, cuddly figure, the sort of grandpa in the sky. But no, God's essential nature is immutable. It never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is a God of holy love. Holy love. Not a love that turns a blind eye to sin, but a love that deals with our sin. Dwight Pentecost surely gets it right when he says that by way of propitiation, the great reservoir of God's love and mercy and grace is unloosed. God is now able to act with great kindness towards us as is his eternal desire but without his holiness or justice being impugned. Or as P.T. Forsyth put it, God's treatment of us changed, but not his feelings towards us. God always loves the sinner. And fourthly, God has no need of propitiation. God has no need to be propitiated. This was a view first formulated by the theologian C.H. Dodd. Dodd contended that propitiation was really a sub-Christian concept. Basically, Dodd, he resented the idea that God would be angry with people because of sin. And Dodd preferred the concept of expiation, which just happens to be the next in our series. Dodd taught that God simply took away sin without the need for there to be a penal substitution, any penal substitution. And Dodd's view has become more popular over time. The concept of God's wrath has been virtually jettisoned by many who claim to be 
Bible-believing Christians. And yet God's wrath against sin is a constant theme of Scripture. Psalm 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. In the New Testament, two Greek words, orage and themos, express God's settled anger against man's sin. Thus John 3, verse 36 reads, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Words, incidentally, spoken by meek and mild Jesus. Or what about Revelation, <coughs> excuse me, what about Revelation 19, verse 15? He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And again, the he there refers to Jesus Christ, the rider on the white horse in John's pictorial language. God's wrath cannot be simply expunged from the Bible or explained away by revisionism. The truth is that God is wrathful towards sin and his holiness demands that it be punished if he is going to receive sinners into his family. I want then to finish today's consideration with uh, just a word of personal challenge. First, for any who are unbelievers, be aware that you still face God's wrath. If you refuse to accept Jesus Christ as your propitiatory sacrifice, then you are still under condemnation and you will suffer the wrath of God eternally. And please don't fall for the error of religion. That is, trying to appease God's wrath by your own decency and good deeds. That is futile. Indeed, it is an offense to God, for it is tantamount to saying no to the gift that he has provided in the death of his son. In this case, you do need to be, you need to emulate the tax collector in our parable. You need to admit that you are a sinner, that you can do nothing to make yourself acceptable to God. Simply cast yourself upon God's mercy and receive forgiveness in his son. Secondly, for those of us who are believers, let us not be embarrassed into silence when it comes to concepts like propitiation and God's wrath. These are thoroughly biblical ideas. Let's not succumb to the spirit of the age which denigrates such concepts because basically they're not what people want to hear. Hold on to the truth. After all, would you not rather believe in a God of holy love than an anything goes type of deity? Jesus Christ gave his life as a propitiation for our sins. Let's then proclaim this truth with confidence and boldness. Amen.